Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in, it's David Summers, and this is it. It's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. So now, let's step back into the ring, back into time. Let's get wall-to-wall and tree-top tall with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Speaking of treetop tall, Ron, I heard you spent a little bit of time with the family. And uh, so you're probably not, this is amazing. You're probably not the tallest in the bunch anymore. <laughs> you must have seen the picture, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I took a picture, I had him take a picture and put it on social media sites. And wow, that thing is blown up. And I'm getting all these remarks about, Ron, are you shrinking or what's this? <laughs> You know, and people saying, I've never seen any picture I've ever seen of you. I've never seen you not be the tallest one. Wow. So, All right. So Chad is like 6'9 or 6'10? Hey, he's 6'10. He's about 6'10 now. I think he's grown a little bit too, I think. That's that. your son. All right. But your grandson, Charles, what is Charles? Is he 6'9 already? No, Charles is. I got him. I look at the picture, Dave, and. I'm the shortest one in the picture, man. <laughs> wow. Charles is only 16 years old, a sophomore in high school. And, you know, uh, well, I got a chance to see him play ball, which was really, really nice. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and he had a good game. The team won, and he did. He had eight points and about uh, five rebounds and four or five block shots. And so, you know, I mean, uh, he had a pretty decent game. For a, for a sophomore, <laughs> all, your, all your all your grandson Charles has got to do is just stand near the basket, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's <laughs> kind of they got the offense set up around him, man. He just stands there about the free throw line, has his hands in the air, and they feed that's him, it. and then he he does the deal from there, man. Uh, pretty good passer, so yeah. you know it was really good. It was really nice to to see them all and uh, spend a little time with them and. I really enjoyed it, man. Uh, some may know, some may not know. You played for the Miami Hurricanes college days way back just a few years ago. Your dad was not very excited about that, was he? No, my dad was not a big fan of basketball. And, uh, you know, so uh, he gave me a lot of problems about uh, he didn't. My dad didn't get into it until I was about a junior in college. Wow. And then he got on fire about coming and he was following. He was flying and seeing seeing me play in <laughs> different places across the country. And, you know, he got a little more inspired by it, but uh, he didn't like it to begin with. That was for sure. All right. So your son, your son, Chad, has been on the fringes of wrestling, but not really a full career doing wrestling. But, no. but for Charles, he wants to play basketball. Oh, yeah. Well, and his dad wants him to play basketball, too. Well, I do, too, after seeing him play. I mean, you know, I think he's uh, I think he's got got a future in it. And I'd love to see him go. Uh, you know, he's in Kentucky, and they got a pretty good basketball team in Kentucky every year. Wow! All right, so did you get the picture up on X Twitter on Twitter? Yeah, I got it up on Twitter. I got it up on uh, all three of my my Facebook sites, and uh, gosh, the response been crazy, man. Uh, a lot, a lot of little smart Alex remarks <laughs> from people about you know. Uh, I'm shrinking and, you know, and uh, they'd never seen me in a picture when I wasn't the tallest person. And, yeah. you know, I got a little of that, but uh, I guess I can deal with it. 
Uh, come on, there's never been a tree taller than the Tennessee stud. That's cool, though. So everybody should really check that out on, on on Facebook and on Twitter. Hey, welcome, everybody. It's the first ever Christmas Day studcast. So Merry Christmas to all. It is officially Christmas. So thank you for joining us for this special studcast. So, uh, stud, it sounds like your Christmas has just been perfect so far. Yeah, so far it's been really great, man. Uh, really, really great. And, uh, so I'm looking forward to to uh, seeing uh, seeing the new year. And uh, wow, especially so far as our our uh, our our studcast is concerned. You know, it's a little cold here. You know, uh, and you know it's been a little cold. And uh, I think we're supposed to get some snow possibly here any day. And then I too want to wish everybody a very merry Christmas, Dave. And uh, I want to thank them for joining us on this special studcast. And this is the first of two in a row that we're going to be doing on, uh, I'm going to call them holiday stud casts. Uh, we're doing this one on Christmas. We'll be doing next week on Monday on New Year's Day. Mm-hmm. But we have a lot of ground to cover in this, man. We're closing out 1979. Wow, a very difficult year for me and about to transition into the new decade, the 1980s. And in my opinion, the early years of the 1980s were the best in the sports history for all territories, and for all of those that were involved in the sport, the wrestlers, the referees, or the owners. Wow. So I think you said, it's amazing when you look back on all that and and start thinking about that. I think at the end of the Studcast last week, you said that you would be doing a recap, a short recap of 1979 before we move in into 1980 and i think everybody who was around at that point i I certainly do remembers 1980 it was an unusual time it seemed like oh wow for all of us man you know and 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 yeah that's what i said i did say that and i'd like to say i look forward to talking about uh, 1979 the end of it but i don't man because it was so now it was such a horrible year so and so everybody that's a stud cast is, is well aware of what a disaster of 1979 was for me. It brought the end of my southeastern two territory dream. It ended all that. Uh, and so let's begin this short recap. I want to do a short recap on the southeastern Gulf Coast territory uh, at the start of the 1979. Actually, I want to do a little bit on both of them, man. So it began with a strong business uh, in January for the Gulf Coast down there. Uh, Then we started sending some of our best talent into the Memphis Territory. Uh, My father and Jerry Jarrett uh, on that territory, Uh, my brother Robert, who was the Gulf Coast booker at that time, uh, he went to Memphis as well. So it was my, you know, it it was okay with me because it was my father's territory. And they were really down and they really needed help. But it was kind of right here at the beginning of the year of 1979. I'm going to call it the curse, man. The curse really got my year off to a bad start. <laughs> so um, I replaced my brother. Uh, I had to have another booker down in the Gulf Coast with Louis Tillet. And uh, Louis was a very successful booker. He had booked for a lot of territories. He booked for the Florida Territory when I went in there as a young guy in 1970. And uh, Louis had worked for me and with me in southeastern in my uh, my Tennessee territory in 1976 and early 1977. And uh, down in the Gulf Coast territory, Louis struggled early on, man. Then he he got a he got a call or somebody turned him on to a guy named Terry Bolia, an unknown talent from Tampa that quickly started to get over. And along with that wrestler who was becoming known as the Hulk. He found an, a very strong Samoan Polynesian tag team, Afa and Secret. Those guys were part of the Rocks family. Uh, they're, they're Polynesian and, and uh, related to the Rock. So by late summer of 1979, he went ahead and added Austin Idol to the territory. And, uh, and he had made some really strides forward, man, uh, from March of 1979 into the summer of 1979. In fact, he drew three very big crowds with the Hulk versus Andre the Giant and an all-time Dothan record crowd in a high school football stadium in July of that year with the Hulk versus Harley Race for the NWA world title. And at that July event in 1979, I was wrestling in Knoxville. It had been for many months, except for an occasional shot. I would go down south and work with Hulk 
because we were trying to get him uh, over and we were trying to uh, have him wrestle some guys that, uh, you know, had had some experience and could teach him something. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, on that same night in Tennessee, I was on the main event, the same night that Harley Race and Hulk wrestled in the Dothan record crowd. I was in Tennessee. I was on the main event in Tennessee with Rob against Jimmy Golden and Norvell Austin, who had both just turned heel in an angle that involved uh, actually my father. So at that Dothan event, the 1979 curse struck again. There were accusations of theft at the box office, payoffs not being correct, a great deal of problems that I could have probably had dealt with and settled to everybody's satisfaction had I been able to be down there. So within a month of all the all the major stars that I mentioned, the Hulk and the Alpha and Sika and Austin Idol, Louis had, you know, those guys that Louis had found and developed, they left the territory and the business went down like the Titanic. Wow. Okay. So uh, uh, to me, a pretty comprehensive recollection of what was happening and what was happening to you in 1979 so far. All right, so, and being from Dothan, I remember you talking about this particular July event. Can you bring back what was happening in the southeastern Tennessee territory during that same time frame? You know what I'm talking about on that? Yeah, yeah. What we'll do is we'll go back to the beginning of 1979 in the Tennessee territory. Yeah, yeah. Just as a comparison of what was going on. Cool. Uh, and they started out early in 1979 very well, too. I had hired Bob Roop as the booker there in the fall of 1978, and business was still good in the early part of 1979. I had no idea what was coming for me, man. By the end of May 1979, Roop had convinced four of my best wrestlers that the five of them could take over the Tennessee Territory, basically. So in June of 1979, the curse struck again in the form of the Knoxville War. And, uh, and that uh, was, uh, you know, all about the future ownership of that territory. Who's going to win the war and who's going to own Knoxville? So in all my 18 years of wrestling, the Knoxville war was by far the worst thing that ever happened to me in the sport. Over the next five months in southeastern Tennessee, from June through October, the Knoxville wrestling war did what most wrestling wars do. It basically killed one of the best territories in history. So the war dropped the size of our normal crowds by only about 25%, but that amounted to pretty much all of the profit from the business, right? So, uh, so what had been a great territory before, and that five before that five months of the war started, became one that no longer produced a profit as it had for the last four years. So almost exactly five years from the day the first ever Southeastern wrestling event. I ever had that I handled and I took control of the business mm -hmm. in 1974, almost exactly five years to the day later, I sold the company. Wow. Okay. And I decided to sell my Tennessee territory to the Georgia promoters, Jim Barnett and Fred Ward, Barnett in Atlanta, Fred Ward in Columbus and Macon, Georgia, some of the other Georgia cities. And I wanted to be finished with the war. I felt like it had killed everything I had worked to build and worse. It was killing my desire to remain in the sport. I couldn't take any more watching what I had worked so hard to develop go down the toilet, man. So, uh, so I felt like the Georgia promoters would probably uh, buy out the Knoxville promoters like Jim Barnett had done in Atlanta when he came there from Australia in 1974. Ann Gunkel, uh, who was the wife of Ray Gunkel, who had died in the ring in Savannah in the uh, in the in about 1972, Ann Gunkel had been in the war with the NWA promoter owners for two years, and uh, so Jim Barnett bought her out, and that ended the war instantly. Wow, I wasn't aware that Barnett bought out his competition in Georgia, also. So, why do you think he didn't buy out the Knoxville Five, his competition, uh, if you could call it that, in Tennessee? Well, I think he underestimated, man, their determination that, you know, they were determined that if they didn't win, they were going to kill wrestling there forever. Wow. <laughs> so all five of those wrestlers involved with all-star wrestling, they suffered financially too, because of that they had been working for me. They'd been making a lot more money. 
<laughs> and then I recently heard somebody say Bob Roop admitted losing at least two hundred thousand dollars in that two year time frame. God, that's a lot of money, Ron. So shows that you made the right decision to sell, even though I know how much it must have hurt you to have to leave Tennessee. Yeah, I didn't lose any money. I got all my original money back. I got the same thing for selling it that I paid for when I bought it. Uh, it was the fans, basically, that were the losers there, man. For the next five years after I left, the business was dying. Barnett and his partner, they didn't make anything in the two years they were there. Then two years later, they they sold to, out to Ric Flair and Black Jack Mulligan, who had a real connection with the Jim Crockett territory out of Charlotte, North Carolina. But they didn't make any money either, man. And in fact, I think they probably lost quite a bit of money. So the Knoxville Five, uh, the all-star group uh, that had left about the same time as Barnett, they they... They gave it up. Knoxville had died for them, too. They gave it up about the same time Barnett and his partner did and sold out uh, about the time Barnett sold out to the Carolina guys. Then the Knoxville Five, you know, they could brag and probably did. They had accomplished what they said they would do. They killed wrestling in eastern Tennessee and Kentucky. Wow. But it wasn't forever, thankfully. Uh, mm. Two years after, basically nobody ran. After... Uh, Ric Flair and Black Jack Mulligan and the North Carolina people failed there too. Nobody ran any wrestling at all in that in that area. And then in five years uh, later, uh, we came back, man, with CCW Continental Championship Wrestling, and uh, it just lit back up like it had been in the old days. And we sold out consistently for years after that. Wow, the Tennessee territory was gone at that point. So. How did the end of 1979 turn out for your Gulf Coast territory and for citizens in the country as a whole in wrestling? Yeah, well, you know, after the sale of Knoxville, there was a, a stream of incoming talent uh, that were going to go down to the Gulf Coast from the Tennessee crew. Uh, they weren't staying because Jim Barnett didn't want but about four guys. And uh, so that lit a fire basically down there in the southeastern Gulf Coast. Uh, for the rest of 1979, business was really good there, but nothing compared to what was going to happen in 1980, man. And uh, and like the rest of the country, let's talk about a little bit of how the rest of the country was doing. The rest of the country and most of its citizens were about to see some great changes, man. In November of 1979, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and the country and its people had no idea what good times were ahead for them. And it had been a long four years for almost everyone. The new president, though, was going to accomplish so much right away that needed to be done to fix things. It seemed like overnight inflation that had bogged down the country for four years, the Iranian hostage situation, and so much more was ended. Bang, quick, like. Um, and, and, man, those were the pivotal things that happened at that point about the time that uh, Ronald Reagan took over. So... That's a great way to begin this stud cast right there, stud. All right, so I knew you had a great card set for Mobile, Alabama on Christmas night, 1979, exactly 44 years ago before today, 44 years ahead of today. So how about giving us the card before we get to our break? Okay, I think it was a good good idea. That'll work, Dave. Uh, Christmas night fell on Tuesday in the year 1979. Uh, so basically, we're today exactly 44 years ago from the same date. Pretty amazing. That's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this on Christmas, because we're going to be talking about a Christmas card from 1979. And that Christmas card was something special, man. The opening match was between two baby faces. Roy Lee Welch was wrestling a great little wrestler named Ted Oates out of Columbus, Georgia. Uh, Joe LaDuke had another handicap match. And uh, last week he had defeated this un, and he not only defeated, but he unmasked a 300 pound plus uh, executioner, he called himself, who turned out to be Tony Peters out of Kingsport, Tennessee. Hmm. So this time Joe was going to be taking on Tony Peters and Tony Peters brought a good buddy of his, another good wrestler out of Knoxville. 
And now he's going to have to beat Peters and Rick Connors, a guy named Rick Connors out of Knoxville. So the third match was for the United States Junior Heavyweight Championship. Tony Charles was defending against the great Mephisto, the man who put him in his camel clutch one week earlier, a week ago in the last stud cast. And, uh, and he did that immediately after Charles won the belt back from Norvell Austin, smacked him from behind, got set down in his back and, uh, choked him out just about with his camel clutch. Wow. So, uh, then the fourth match was for the Southeastern championship, uh, tag championship. The Mongolians managed by the great Mephisto were wrestling Jerry Stubbs, but, uh, Stubbs had been switching partners every week. He was trying to find the right combination to win the belts back that one time he and Rob had. So on this card, uh, Jerry Stubbs chose someone that had been in mobile and not been there for many, many months. And he was a youngster, a guy named Eddie Boulder, that had improved greatly since he arrived uh, with his best friend, the Hulk, months ago. Uh, he'd been gone. Uh, Hulk left. Uh, Eddie was out of the picture. And he had inherited the last name uh, Boulder because that's what name the Hulk wanted to be called when he started wrestling. They wanted to call him. He wanted to insist that we won't be, I want to be called Terry Boulder. Hmm. Well, they didn't really do that much for him. They didn't listen to what he wanted uh, so far as his name was concerned. Mm -hmm. So Jerry Stubbs was teaming up with Eddie Boulder to get another shot at the tag team championship. Fifth match on this card was a continuation of the fruit, the big feud between the two pros. And uh, this time it was a Texas death match between the wrestling pro and the super pro. The main event was a six man tag. The Mongolian Stomper had gotten himself involved in the tag match between Rob and I versus Golden and Austin the week before. Stomper came down uh, uh, to help them out, and uh, you know the, they were bringing in another uh, mystery man for uh, the, we were going to bring in another mystery man for our partner. So we're mm-hmm. going to have a six-man tag for the main event: Mongolian Stomper, Jimmy Golden, Norvell Austin against me, Rob, and a mystery man. Wow, okay. That's a spectacular card right there. Uh, two title matches, a Texas death match, and a six-man tag with the Mongolian Stomper teaming with Jimmy Golden and Norvell Austin against you, your brother, and a mystery partner. So uh, that's pretty jam up right there. All right, so let's go to our break. This is a good time for that. When we come back right after the break, we're going to be talking about what a great TV show you've got ready that's coming up when this stud cast on christmas day continues hey stud on this break i think it's a great time and uh, you wanted to do this specifically it's a great time to say thanks to all the listeners all the fans that hang in there with us week after week and even on youtube and even on tnstud.com for all these stud cast and everything else is going on yeah you know i uh- we don't get to do it very often, and gosh, I really appreciate the fans I have, and they're pretty amazing how they've been hanging in here for years. We've been doing this for six years, and wow, just uh, it's amazing. I can't believe it at this point. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just really appreciate everybody's uh, continued support. It's pretty amazing, like I said. And, uh, you know, I, to really, uh, I really feel like uh, – it's a little bit special doing this one on Christmas uh, because it's such a special day and it's going to, uh, hopefully it's going to have give people a chance to maybe, uh, maybe get to their stud cast a little, a uh, little uh, earlier than usual. Oh, absolutely. And you know, hopefully you've got time there at home to spend time with family and friends and the neighbors and that kind of thing. So if you hopefully do have some free time on your hand, Stud, you've got so much going on at tnstud.com. That's your that's your home website. And then the same thing over on YouTube, Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. Literally hundreds of hours of audio and video. We could really keep somebody busy over the holidays. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I've been working hard. Tell you that. <laughs> you know, we we uh, put together a pretty good YouTube channel. And uh, and I think we got another surprise. I'm not going to talk about it uh, much today but uh, uh we got another streaming channel that may be coming that's going to be uh basically all mine all my stuff and uh i've never done one like that before and uh, so i'm going to be starting to work on that pretty soon so 
Yeah, I, I put a lot of time in this and a lot of effort into it, but uh, I love it. It's, uh, you know, it was my life for so many years and it's still my life. <laughs> I'm so proud that you have the opportunity to document this. And hey, let me mention this for folks that on Christmas Day, maybe you got money from Santa for Christmas Day. TNstud.com, that's the home of the stud store. And stud, you got a ton of stuff on there. You got t-shirts, you got your even autographed if you want it, your book Brutus, and you've got eight by ten, eight by ten photos on there, and plenty to do at TNstud.com. Yeah, yep. Still got t-shirts, man, for fifteen ninety nine. I don't know where you can buy that anywhere. You know, there's still some of those available that were on sale for Christmas and and it's going to leave them at the same price. And, uh, you know, people are welcome to go and have a look at it. And, you know, uh, I just uh, like you say, I think I got I'm almost got too much going, Dave. I might have to <laughs> start thinking about chopping it back a little bit. Yeah. You know, you, you're probably going to need one of those long winter's naps before this thing is, <laughs> is all said and done. Hey, listen, thank you again, Stud. Thank you for everything that you do. And then for the listeners, the fans. Everybody, listen, I'm just humbled to be a small part of what we do here. And hopefully what I do facilitates getting the word out on your behalf. But listen, Merry Christmas, everybody. And one week from today, New Year's Day, will be the next Studcast. One week from today, I hope you can check it out. And thank you again for listening to this one and all the ones that preceded this one and everything else that's going on. All right, so, Stud, as we get into the second half here, after hearing that Christmas card, that Christmas time nighttime card, I can only imagine what was on the TV show promoting that special Mobile, Alabama event. Tell us about that. Well, the TV, man, was just as special, man, and loaded with stars and surprises as as the night of matches that occurred on Christmas night. So, it, you know, it ended up with Rob and I in a tag match. Uh, but, uh, we, you know, the end of this wrestling show ends with me and Rob. We got it. We're in the tag match on the end of the show. But let's jump back to the opening here, which was with the great Mephisto and his tag team champions. Uh, and one of them was the TV champion, the Mongolian Stomper. And at this point, he was also the new Southeastern champion as well. He had beaten Bob Armstrong the week before in a loser leave. So it was the first time in Southeastern history, either in Tennessee or in the Gulf Coast, that any wrestler had owned all three of those titles at the same time. So Mephisto was the man, he was about as puffed up man as a, as a I think they call him an adder uh, in, uh, in Egypt and in that part of the world. Yeah, There's a yeah. Po- poisonous snake called an adder, man. A puff adder, yeah. Mephisto was just as dangerous <laughs> as a snake. Wow, man, yeah. Sure. And uh, so he could hardly wait for Charlie Platt, to, when he's with him at the set, to call for the video because they were going to show the Bob Armstrong match with his stomper where Bob Armstrong lost his belt and he also lost his right to continue to wrestle for Southeastern fans. So the video showed Bob had the stomper and the sleeper and the referee uh, was right in front of Bob and right in front of the stomper, you know, just uh, checking to see he's not choking him. And uh, the stomper reaches out and pulls the referee head to head with Bob. And uh, all three of them went down. Mephisto crawled into the ring like the snake he was. And he put Bob Armstrong in his camel clutch, which was his finishing hole. And then he released it. As soon as he saw the referee was about to get up, he released it. He turned Bob Armstrong over on his back. He pulled the stomper over on top of him. And then he shot out of the ring. The referee never saw him. Bob was counted out uh, and on was a loser leave Southeastern match to a dead silent crowd. <laughs> I, you know, uh, I heard that I wasn't on there. I wasn't there on these cards, so I didn't get to see exactly what had happened. But I can only imagine when fans realize that Bob Armstrong is going to lose here. Uh, it, they, the crowd I had a couple of wrestlers say, Ron, the crowd went totally silent. You know, they couldn't believe what just happened. So the two Mongolians standing behind Charlie and Mephisto at the set at that point, they started to celebrate, man, slapping each other on the back and smiling from ear to ear. And the studio crowd, they were booing. And so uh, Charlie invited Mephisto and his tag partners to stay with him at the set. 
because they were about to get their first look at the next, next tag team that was going to be coming after their belts. So Jerry Stubbs, like I'd mentioned earlier, had no success in winning the tag belts back with Kevin Sullivan or Robert as a partner. So he gets himself a new partner, Eddie Boulder. And uh, Eddie Boulder was a lifetime friend of the Hulk, man. And he was also from the Tampa area. And years later, Eddie Boulder is going to become a big star in the WWE <laughs> as Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Yeah, yeah. So the fans had only seen him in a few matches months ago when he arrived with the Hulk. So he was even more muscular now and uh, you know, than he had been when he left. And it didn't take long for the studio crowd to realize he was also a lot better wrestler. And uh, they, they went nuts, man, when he, 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 he got in the ring. The first time he got in the ring, uh, he not only beat the heck out of both people, but he won with a submission uh, in the first, he never tagged out. I mean, so, so Mephisto was not impressed, though, or concerned that his tag team was going to be defending against the two guys they just saw. So Mephisto had nothing to say about Boulder. But he did say to his team, you know, that they need to get rid of Jerry Stubbs as soon as possible. <laughs> All right. I remember Eddie Boulder. He was a lot better, a lot better wrestler this time than the first time, like when he first came to Southeastern. But I never connected him to Brutus the Barber Beefcake until you mentioned that. So how about the second TV segment? Well, Joe LaDuke opened that one up. He was at the set with Charlie. They watched the video of him beating this 300 and three, 300 plus pound executioner, taking his mask off. And uh, now the uh, executioner, as I mentioned earlier, was going to be coming back with his friend that trained him, a guy, you know, uh, named Rick Connors from Knoxville. And uh, they were going to both get a shot at Joe, uh, you know. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> then Joe looked over at the, uh, and I was at this TV show. Joe looked over at Charlie at the end of it. And, and after, you know, uh, Charlie kind of explaining, he's got his buddy and they come back again. They're going to try you again, Joe. And Joe said, uh, you know, this guy not too smart. <laughs> what old Joe's he wasn't. He had that French Canadian accent. And uh, so the crowd got the studio got a big laugh out of it. Uh, I did, too. <laughs> so then, Dave, your man. The wrestling pro took the ring and he got a big hand, obviously. Uh, his opponent the next week uh, in a Texas death match was going to be the super pro. Super pro went to the set with Charlie. They talked about that upcoming match with Leon Baxter, the wrestling pro. Uh, while that was going on, Leon did his thing in the ring, man. And uh, he was pretty good at doing his thing. And the super pro was not impressed by what he saw the ring, or at least he told Charlie he wasn't. And he kept referring to that upcoming Texas death match. And he was making a point that uh, the wrestling pro was, at this point, way over the hill in age. He was ripe for the taking, man, especially in a grueling Texas death match. <laughs> he said it was the perfect match for him to take that old man's mask off, reveal who he is, retire him, and then become the only pro. And uh, it was possibly, you know, probably a good thing that the wrestling pro couldn't hear what was being said, you know, <laughs> what was going on over at the set or, you know, uh, said about him being old and over the hill and not going to be able to handle a Texas death match. Because knowing the pro, he would have left the ring and come and gone after the super pro right then. You know, the wrestling pro didn't take nasty comments lightly, that's for sure. And one thing I knew about him was he was not a man of many words. It seemed like he did all of his work in the ring, and that let that do the talking for him. But this super pro was really beginning to look a lot more dangerous, maybe, than anyone thought when he arrived. So how about the personality profile? What was up on that? Okay, so Rob and I joined Charlie, man, uh, and they, they brought out the profile chairs. We, we had a profile chair each, and, uh, and it was uh, one of the most interesting profiles. This is going to turn out to be, I think, one of the most interesting profiles in Southeastern history. We're going to watch two videos in the course of this profile. The first was what happened in Mobile, the Wednesday night before this TV show. It showed the Mongolian Stomper coming down the ring at the end of Rob and I's tag match uh, with 
Jimmy Golden and Norvell Austin, and the Stomper attacked me from behind. And the Stomper uh, getting involved was the reason we basically asked for the six man upcoming uh, six man Christmas night tag. So the three of us, uh, you know, discussed that Charlie and Rob and I about after being uh, gone for down there for uh, for a long time. Uh, I planned on the, you know, we had planned on the mystery man in this in the past tag match as a surprise for fans and our opponents. In the last tag match, Rob was in the last match by himself, and uh, and uh, that nobody knew who the mystery man was. So I reminded Charlie how the TV show ended the week before. It ended up in a wild fight because uh, everybody came out and got involved in this. And um, and so after Golden and Austin attacked Rob in the ring, he was by himself. All hell broke loose in the in the uh, studio, and uh, so I was the mystery man, and now I was forced to come to the ring at that point and let everybody know who Rob's mystery partner was because Rob needed to help. Uh, a lot of guys couldn't get into the ring; they got pulled back from the ring. So Charlie kind of apologized for what happened the week before. I told him it was all right. It was in no way his fault, obviously. But Rob and I, you know, I told him, but me and Rob have talked about this mystery partner idea a little bit, uh, with Charlie. And uh, and from our team, you know, uh, uh, in this upcoming six-man six tag, uh, and we've decided, Charlie, that uh, we don't want it to be a mystery. We want to introduce the man right now. So the studio popped. You know, and Charlie asked for someone to bring another chair to the profile set. So then out of the dressing room came our father, Buddy Fuller. <laughs> and the crowd cheered, but not as loud as Rob and I had expected, because it was the first time in Southeastern Gulf Coast history that my dad had been on a TV show. We never thought about it, but he had not been on a television show ever since uh, in that first year, or close to two years at this point. So Charlie, being a consummate pro, though, and knowing many fans, wasn't going to recognize who Dad was. Uh, he started to explain to everyone that our father was a living legend in this part of the country, that he was the main event wrestler against Mario Galento in one of the most famous matches in Alabama wrestling history. And it occurred in front of one of the largest crowd in the history of the sport, and uh, then the studio responded again, this time with a little bit more appreciation. And Charlie welcomed Dad, and my father thanked him, and he, uh, you know, he said something nice about the studio crowd. And so when I said earlier that I thought this was going to be an extremely interesting profile, and it's right here where it kind of becomes that. So there was another reason for us to pick our father as a partner in this match. We had never before <coughs> seen... And we had a video that had never before been seen in Alabama. And uh, so this video was going to show the real reason we wanted our father in this match. And there was another one of those tremendous videos from the Tennessee Territory. This one, this night that it was recorded on was July 6th, 1979 in Chilhowee Park, to be exact. And it was a no disqualification Southeastern Championship match. It was me. And my father, we were the champions at that time, defending for the third week in a row against Tor Tanaka and Mr. Fuji. Mr. Fuji and Tanaka were managed by Gorgeous George Jr. And uh, this time we had a manager of our own. And it was at that time the very popular, wow, fans loved him, Jimmy Golden, my cousin and my dad's nephew, right? He was our manager that night. So Charlie had never seen any of this. And, you know, and neither had anybody else so that were watching in the studio and all the monitors. Uh, and he was blown away that we had this footage. And, you know, he didn't know what to expect, just like they did. So I let fans know that this was the old Jimmy Golden <laughs> that they're seeing in this video, uh, at the beginning of it anyway. And then a family member had, uh, you know, he was a family member that at that point had never done anything like this before. So I told them this was the night Jimmy Golden changed his career and his life. So the video opened with a shot at Chilai Park Amphitheater. Uh, it was sold out, had over 6,000 fans in it. It was very, uh, very effective uh, shot, man. Uh, it really made that place look good. Uh, and then the match started, and he nailed my father 
from behind. And uh, he put the boots to Tanaka and Fuji. And, uh, and then uh, Golden, uh, you know, knew my father had a bad back, you know. Uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, he, he, he got, once he got in the ring and he, he dangled my dad from behind, and I was fighting out there on the floor with Gorgeous George Jr., Jimmy had actually nailed me first, and he'd pile drive me on the concrete. Then he went in the ring, and he had Dad, uh, you know, he hit Dad from behind, and uh, so he let Tanaka and them kind of get their composure back. And then uh, Jimmy Golden knew Dad had a bad back and had a surgery probably five years earlier. And he had Tanaka get hold of Dad's arms, and he had Fuji get hold of his legs, and they raised him up in the air uh, about uh, waist high, on both of them and uh, golden climbed up on the top rope and he jumped off across my dad's body and he crashed down on top of it and i don't know which sound was louder <laughs> charlie never seen this uh, i don't know if charlie screamed louder or the studio watching that bump man wow wow and then the video ended with my dad being carried out on a stretcher are you kidding? Wow. All right. That had to be one of the most devastating moves that you could do to a person, period. So I think you said Charlie uh, let out a pretty good yell on your dad's behalf. Other than that, how did how did he react after all that? Well, he, he said something about, you know, he said, he says, uh, I'm glad I got to see this. He said, you know, I had never known what Jimmy Golden did. I never knew Jimmy Golden did this stuff. And, you know, and he goes, uh, so I finally found out why Jimmy Golden ate the nice Jimmy Golden he was before. So then Robin asked Charlie if, if we could add one more wrestler to our upcoming tag match, the last match in the show. And, uh, you know, and he said, well, I, I don't, I got on he, he kind of fumbled around because he really didn't, wasn't expecting. And uh, so I said, we got a guy, man, who has not been in the ring for a while. And we need to get him a warm-up match, you know. And uh, before we turn this guy loose on Golden Austin and the Mongolian Stomper, <laughs> we want to get him a little warm-up match. So Charlie said, well, absolutely, you know. And he announced, okay, we're going to have a six-man tag instead of a four-man tag on the last match of the day. Oh, cool. We'll take that. All right, so you really weren't kidding about that being one of the best personality profiles Ever. That kind of topped it right there. All right, so how about the third TV match? Well, the United States Junior Heavyweight Champion, Tony Charles, was, was uh, the great Mephisto came to the set. Charles was in the ring. And he insisted to get to watch this match and to comment on the, on the guy he called. I think he called him a European infidel. You know, and uh, he said, uh, you know, and, and Tony didn't, didn't hear him. And, it, and Donnie didn't care, man. He was sending this, his unlucky opponent skyward, man, in the ring. He was just hitting him with throw after throw, uh, Tony called him. And uh, so Mephisto, uh, he bragged about being the world junior heavyweight champion for two years. He said he really wasn't interested in being the lowly United States junior champion. But he said since the stupid Englishman got mad at him and he offered to give him a title shot, he goes he, to Charlie because I might as well win another championship while I'm here in this deprived part of the country, you know, in this part of the world. So, uh, so you know, Tony finished off his opponent. Then he, then he motioned for the Arab to come on into the ring with Mephisto. You know, he, he put him down, man. He gave him an arrogant flick of the hand like, hey, you mean nothing on his way back to the dressing room. <laughs> All right, so I guess it was time for the – Finally, time for the six-man tag on TV. So that must be why the title of this stud cast, number 330, is Christmas 1979 Fuller's Fight. Yeah, we're kind of in the position here, man, where we got uh, into this six-man tag. And, uh, well, we've got uh, Golan and Austin that been screwing with us for a while. So that title... You know, was going to come true four days after this TV show on Christmas night, 1979, when we had that six-man tag. So this TV match was all about introducing our father to the Gulf Coast fans. And uh, my dad loved the fact that we were going to let him have a big portion of the match. And so, uh, you know, we gave we had, he had some young punks in the ring, and he was going to teach these young punks a lesson, man, uh, a wrestling, going to give them a wrestling lesson. And in the process, uh, 
he was going to make them all look like fools. And that's exactly what he did in this match. Uh, you know, looked like uh, this match looked like more like uh, instead of the being the Fuller's fight that we just uh, used as the title, this was going to be the Fuller's fun before the Fuller's fight. So uh, Jimmy Golden, Norvell, and the Mongolian Stomper came uninvited to the set with Charlie as soon as we all got in there. And Golden had to have his moment to respond to the remarks that had been made about him during the personality profile. And he told Charlie, he said, I, Charlie Platt, I want to tell you a quick story of why I hurt Buddy Fuller last summer. So he, so here was his story. He said, uh, he said, you know, Ch Charlie, I got in a little trouble with the law. I was 16 years old. And he goes, my daddy sent me to live with Buddy Fuller and his spoiled sons and try to, and they were going to try to straighten me out. Right. And then he said uh, that he didn't really that he didn't need any straightening out. But he said that old man up there in the ring, he said, pointing at dad, uh, he said it treated me like a piece of trash. He said he made me work like a slave on his farm six days a week. So Charlie interrupted him and he said, uh, well, did he make his sons work like that, too? And uh, Golden didn't even answer the question. He told Charlie to keep his mouth shut <laughs> until I finished my story. Right. So so he continued. He said when he finally sneaked off that farm, he said, I promised myself I was going to get even with Buddy Fuller someday. And last summer was that day. And oh, what a glorious day it was. And he finished saying, you know, after I finished with him, I never expected to see him again, much less in the ring again. Right. So he says those Fuller boys up there, they're just as bad as their daddy. And all three of them in that ring, we're going to have to, they're going to have to fight for their life uh, come uh, Christmas night. So the three of them in uh, suddenly left the set. Uh, then they went to the far side of the ring. They didn't go back to the dressing room. Uh, and they just stood there uh, next to the apron of the ring looking at us while we're having the match. And then Joe LaDuke came out of the, came out of the, the dressing room. And he came and stood in our corner. And, uh, and he was just staring down the Mongolian stomper. Well, people didn't know what Joel Duke was there for. You know, no, no, none of this, nothing much has come out of this yet. So the studio audience, Charlie Platt, and the three of us, we're getting uh, ready for another brawl, man. Uh, there's the three of them. They're standing right there, man. They, they're going to come, right? Like the one that ended up the show before. But then suddenly, man, the great Mephisto, he came running out to get the stomper. Took his stomper right, right back in the dressing room. About the same time as Dad hooked another victim in his famous full of leg lock. And as soon as the stomper left ringside, Joe LaDuke went right back to the dressing room. But Golden and Austin stood there at ringside until we left the ring. Until Dad won the match, he raised our hands, and mm. we left the room. All right, so there are some things going on between quite a few wrestlers that's kind of getting to the boiling point, obviously, in some cases, that really have not been explained. But I know better than to ask questions at this point. That's a tremendous TV show that you just knocked out right there. So what happened on Christmas night, 1979, down in Mobile, Alabama? Well, the night got off to a great start. Roy Lee Welch uh, got a win over Ted Oates. But, wow, it was a wonderful babyface match. I watched it. Those guys really, really wrestled the entire match. Fans fans applauded real clean wrestling. You don't see that much. Hey. You don't see that at all anymore. That's a lost art. There are, there's no matches like that anymore. So Joe LaDuke uh, kept his love affair with the crowd going, man. Uh, he beat both these Tennessee, and uh, he took care of the guy from Kingsport, the executioner, Tony Peters. And he also beat Rick Connors. And at the end of the match, he piled one of them on top of each other and he covered them both for the pin. So he really did it right. Then in the United States Junior Championship match, Great Mephisto was having a real problem with Tony Charles' wrestling skills. He had never been in there with a guy that could do the stuff Tony did. So to compete, when Tony was uh, really close to beating him and to save himself, uh, when both guys were fighting on the ropes, he took something out of his tights. This is this was pretty cool, uh, you know. You, uh, this you didn't see this type of stuff very much. 
they're kind of fighting down the ropes and he reaches and gets something out of his tights and he stuffs it into the back of Tony's tights and then he knocks Tony out of the ring. So uh, Tony didn't hurt Tony really badly. So uh, he charged back up into the ring, uh, you know, and uh, for the, he was ready to finish Mephisto off. And so as soon as he charged in the ring, Mephisto got the referee and pushed him in for, between him and Charlie, between him and uh, Tony. And he said, uh, check him, check him. He's got a foreign object on him. And the referee, you know, <laughs> went around and he went over to Tony Stites and he ran his hand around. And sure enough, it, you know, he stopped the match. He rang the bell. He disqualified Tony and raised Mephisto's hand. You know, and it saved Mephisto from a loss. Uh, you know, uh, but but he because he you know he couldn't win the, by by disqualification. But uh, you know, uh, so it was it was a uh, it was something that uh, I don't I had never seen that before. Uh, pretty crazy. Yeah, I bet the fans had never seen or heard of one like that either. So pretty smart of Mephisto, I guess you would say. To keep from getting beat in the middle of the ring, he planted an object on his opponent and then made the referee find it. That's just, that's brilliant. <laughs> and then, who's declared the winner? Mephisto. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Frankie Kane, um, the great Mephisto, he was one of the brightest men in the sport, Dave. Uh, he had seen and done most everything, man, by this point in his career. And, uh, Wow, he, he pulled one on me and, uh, and everybody else that I'd never seen before. So in the Southeastern title match, Eddie Boulder and Jerry Stubbs, they looked like they had been working together as a team for years. Uh, and Mephisto, again, was a factor in getting Jerry Stubbs beat in this match. Uh, then the Texas death match between the wrestling pro and the super pro. The super pro had Leon you know, uh, bleeding, man, and about to lose his mask. He had ripped the face out of the mask, and he was trying to take it off. And then uh, the wrestling pro from out of nowhere grabbed the super pro in a sleeper hole, man. Uh, so he won it. Uh, this was in the fifth round, I believe, of the Texas death match. And so he won that, uh, won that fall of the match, and then he left the super pro laying there. During the 30-second rest period, he didn't wake him up, right? And, uh, and, and so it's pretty smart because it's a Texas death match, and the guy's going to get a 10 count to get up. Uh, so why wake him up? So when, when the bell sounded and they started the 10 count, uh, he went over and woke him up. But uh, Super Pro didn't have, he didn't, have the, he didn't have his old faculties about him, and uh, so he wasn't able to get up in time to beat mm. the – the, the ten sound, the ten count, and, right. uh, so wow. uh, wrestling pro uh, wins another one against him. <laughs> so six man tag at the end of the night, it was truly a fight. Uh, you know that's kind of why the title of this is that uh, four of the six men in the ring were bleeding before it was over. The great Mephisto got involved. Uh, he became the seventh man in the ring, and he caused the disqualification of his team. But uh, it didn't happen before Joe LaDuke became the eighth man in the ring. And he went right straight after the Mongolian stomper. Wow. The great Mephisto got his champion out of the ring as quick as he could and ran him back to the dressing room. Wow. That's a great night of wrestling. And I always remember the ending because if you were still talking about it when you got out to the car, you know, that was a big night of wrestling and still talking when dad cranked the car and headed on down the road. All right. So this was really the beginning of Christmas week when you've been saying business would start to take off. So how did the three markets, the three major markets there in Southeast Alabama do? Well, all three major markets, man, had the same card as Mobile and Montgomery, you know, uh, Montgomery. Montgomery and Dothan had that same card. Montgomery, which normally ran on a Monday night, it had to be moved because we were going to run in Mobile on that Monday night. So it got moved to a Saturday, which is a great night, right? Uh, so that helped it even more because it was on a weekend. So it set a new record, almost a total sellout of the Civic Center. Had uh, almost 5,900 fans. Uh, Dothan had 5,200 fans. Uh, Mobile's Expo Hall was packed at 5,500, and uh, there was a lot of people turned away. 
And then the three city total for, for that week was 15,600 fans, more than 5,000 fans larger than the week before. So if we added the other three cities that ran that week, which was Pensacola, ran on a Sunday, Panama City ran on a Thursday, Crestview ran during the week. Uh, the one week total for the entire territory was 24,600 fans uh, starting on Christmas, the week of uh, Christmas night, uh, far larger than any week in uh, southeastern Knoxville history. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Almost 25,000. That had to be that had to be close to, if not, maybe the best week so far in southeastern Gulf Coast history. All right, I, I know you wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the next stud cast when we get to this point. So I think you said it was going to be another special one and released two days early as this one is. That's going to be on New Year's Day. We mentioned that earlier. Yes. Yes. So, um, so uh, you know, the next one, the, obviously, we're going to be on, it's going to be on Monday, New Year's Day, January 1st, 2024. And uh, I'm going to be doing my first ever. I have been mentioning this for the last two or three stud casts. I'm going to start doing these. Uh, stud cast lessons. I'm going to start teaching listeners about all kinds of wrestling subjects. And I'm going to break each one down into smaller pieces so that fans are going to understand how and why things did and sometimes didn't work out. And, uh, and I want my fans to be the most knowledgeable in all of wrestling. Uh, I'm going to give them a, an education in the sport that will only happen here on my stud cast. So I'm going to start on the next stud cast. And the first subject is going to be the disaster. And, and, I, and that's the only way I can put this, is the disaster the Knoxville War had become for not only me, but for the Tennessee fans as well. And uh, we're going to be discussing in the next stud cast the terrible transition that the Georgia promoters made after my sale to them, which uh, they were as responsible, more responsible for anyone. Uh, as to why it didn't work. And I'm going to explain how Tennessee fans in 1979 were not properly considered by the new owners and how, in my opinion, the new owners buried themselves because they really got started before they buried themselves before they ever really got started. So hopefully our Tennessee fans are going to love what is happening now down here on the Gulf Coast and consider it an extension of their Southeastern from 1980, uh, all the way up until Continental Wrestling is going to return there to Tennessee six years later. So next stud cast is going to also take us into the 1980s uh, and the greatest and uh, at the same time, the most devastating decade in the sports history. No doubt about it. Starts out wonderfully. By the time the 80s are done, so is wrestling, basically. So our focus was on the first week of January. We're going to focus on, focus on the first week of January 1980 down in the southeastern Gulf Coast Territory. We'll be back in Mobile, but this time we're going to be in the beautiful round main arena that holds 10,000 fans with a card designed to pack it. So featuring, it's going to feature a two-ring triple chance over the top rope battle royal with $10,000 going to the two winners. And the first time fans in that part of the country were going to experience Jola Duke and a Mondolian Stomper encounter. I tell you, this has been a fun stud cast on Christmas Day. I, man, I think a lot of folks have really enjoyed this, especially on Christmas Day. And another reminder, next Monday, one week from today, New Year's Day, January 1st, 2024, we're going to do another special stud cast. After that, we go back to the regular Wednesday releases. So don't forget one week from today, New Year's Day. We'll be wishing you Happy New Year's one week from today. So in the meantime, thank you for being with us on this Christmas Day. Hey, you know you can find Ron on Facebook at Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. Like and follow him there. Automatically become friends with a living legend. Simple to do. Same thing on Twitter, also known as X. Find him at Ron Fuller Welch. 
Follow him there on X. Check out the fantastic website at tnstud.com. This studcast is going to be there with every studcast ever done. tnstud.com. That's where you can shop the stud store where you get 43 super studcasts that are just crammed full of wrestling history with some major superstars. Four different 8x10 photos, the thrilling lion novel called Brutus, and it can be personally autographed to you if you like, and autographed to anyone for that matter, and t-shirts still on sale right now, only $15.99. Maybe you got a little bit of cash for Christmas. This would be perfect for that. Free shipping, by the way. Doesn't matter that Christmas is today. You can get that anytime. And while those while the supply lasts on those t-shirts, by the way, only $15.99. That is a terrific deal. Also, subscribe now at YouTube Southeastern Rewind. Get the best in old school wrestling. Find 375 videos. The last 170 107 stud cast, 52 stud stories, 89 short rides with the stud, and now 12 great. Ask the stud question and answer shows. Number 12 just hit recently. If you had a, hadn't had a chance to hear that one, you got to check it out. Ask the stud number 12. That's the newest. All exclusively on Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. It's the best deal in old school wrestling. Hey, one more time, stud. Merry Christmas. And any final comments? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I'm like you, man. Uh, one more time, I'd like to... You know, hope everybody has a very Merry Christmas out there. And uh, Lord help us, man, to not forget and what Christmas is all about. And uh, more than ever, take care of yourselves and others. And may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud. LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.